going to get started here in a minute. Um, first, I want to thank all of you for coming out this afternoon. Uh, we at Notre Dame Young Americans for Freedom are thrilled to be hosting this event and bring a strong conservative voice to campus. However, none of this would be possible without our without the generous support of our um, sponsors. Uh, so I'd like to thank the Tocqueville program and the Tenziani program in constitutional studies here at Notre Dame for their support. And I would also like to especially thank the Young Americans Foundation for all of their support and assistance which made this event a reality. On that note, I would like to invite up our Vice Chair, Jake Duncan, who will be introducing Mr. Forbes. Steve Forbes was born on July 18, 1947, in Morristown, New Jersey. He left home at the age of 14 to attend the Brooks School in North Andover, Massachusetts, where he would eventually graduate with honors. Following his graduation in 1966, Forbes studied at Princeton University. There he guided his first magazine, serving as editor for the student publication, Business Today. In 1973, following his graduation from Princeton, he began writing his own column for his father's magazine, Forbes. When his father died in 1990, Mr. Forbes took over the magazine, where he remains editor-in-chief to this day. Mr. Forbes has also made his mark outside of the business world in politics, where he championed the institution of a national flat tax. Mr. Forbes sought the Republican nomination in 1996 and in 2000. In 1996, he won both the Arizona and Delaware primaries. He advocated for free trade, health savings accounts, and many other conservative fiscal values. More recently, he has written several books, including How Capitalism Will Save Us in 2009, and Why Free Markets Are Moral and Big Government Isn't in 2012. Mr. Forbes now serves on the boards of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation, the Heritage Foundation, and the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Steve Forbes. Thank you uh, very much, Jake, for that very kind introduction. And thank all of you for coming out here on such a nice afternoon. I was told by the locals here that uh, this weather is year-round. So, uh, <laughs> so, somehow I'm a little skeptical of that. This is not San Diego, exactly. A lot, a lot of great things here. But it is a pleasure to be here. And I've, asked, and I've uh, been asked today to talk about uh, the morality of capitalism. And the idea of having the word morality associated with capitalism, free markets, free enterprise, uh, sounds, sounds a little strange. Because capitalism, certainly in the popular culture, is never seen as a moral system. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, you're all familiar with the raps against uh, capitalism, free markets. It is seen as being based on greed. It puts profits before people. Uh, markets are cold, heartless, hard, where the strong crush the weak, where uh, the rich get richer and the poor always struggle. You're familiar with the Hollywood caricatures. The villains in the movies are often businessmen, not women, businessmen. And either they're obesely fat, jowls going up and down in glee as they plot to make our lives miserable, or they are bony, skinny, flinty with fingers crackling and how they figure out how to pollute rivers and kill household pets and things like that. <laughs> and, and, and research has shown that in the movies, uh, businessmen, kill more people than serial killers do. <laughs> it, 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 that, that, that's how a capitalism is portrayed, a bunch of crooks. So the system is seen as sort of amoral. It, yes, it gives us a higher standard of living, may give us the goods, but it's not the most exalted of occupations. In fact, it is a little bit grubby in terms of a popular <clears throat> perception often. It's not on the moral plane of philanthropy, or literature, the arts, public service. In fact, philanthropy and commerce are portrayed as polar opposites. If you succeed in business, you make up for your sins by giving your money away. Uh, and the words, I use them all the time, but think of the words giving back. Not giving, but giving back. Giving back, if you think about it, sounds like you took something that wasn't yours in the first place. You know, when you're growing up in the sandbox, don't take Freddy's uh, toy, give it back. 
And so there's this idea that uh, business is not the same, uh, in the same plane as, more, as uh, uh, philanthropy, and it uh, perpetuates itself in the, in the popular culture. But the fact of the matter is that even though we may get a higher standard of living from it, if a system is not seen as moral, if it's seen as immoral or at best amoral, ultimately it will be undermined. After every crisis, it gets more burdens, more regulations, it gets blamed for the crisis, even though every major economic crisis of the past hundred years can be laid at the feet of the origins of massive government error, but the free markets get blamed for it, and the scope for free markets becomes narrower. We see it today with the rise of, of crony capitalism, where more and more you do well by who you know in government, not by pleasing people in the marketplace. But the fact of the matter is, philanthropy and commerce are not polar opposites. In fact, they're two sides of the same coin, which gets to the seeming paradox of the United States. The United States is the most commercial nation ever invented, but it's also the most philanthropic nation in the world, in terms of not just money giving, but the hundreds of millions of hours that people <coughs> donate each year. And the reason that commerce is based on morality uh, is very simple. In true free markets, you succeed only by needing, meeting the needs and wants of other people. Meeting the needs and wants of other people. Now, sometimes there's the famous words of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was once asked if he did marketing surveys. He said no, because people don't know what they want until we show them coming up with products that no one had conceived of, then a short while later we discover we can't live without them. But even if you're that caricature, that Hollywood caricature, even if you have that rotten personality uh, that makes babies cry and dogs bark at you when you walk down the street, even if you lust for the money, you don't get it unless you provide something that somebody else wants or somebody else feels they need. Adam Smith, over two centuries ago, we talked about the nature of transactions, trading with each other, buying and selling. Each gets something from the transactions. Why we don't live in caves anymore is because we're able to deal with one another, uh, get more and more specialized, and uh, do, do things that make a life a little better than bare subsistence. So each gets something. Now, not all transactions are the same. Uh, buying a handbag or getting a new sports car or a ticket to a hard uh, sports match is much more fun than, say, paying the electricity bill or paying the rent if you're uh, renting a, an apartment. But uh, sometimes it sort of amazes me that uh, those who complain about electricity bills don't hesitate to go out and spend two to three hundred dollars buying a pair of blue jeans that look like they came out of a, a dumpster. But you know, that, 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 that's human nature. That's human nature. But contrary, contrary to a uh, uh, myth about free markets, about capitalism, it actually promotes human cooperation. It's not just a cold individual thing. Take what we now call supply chains. All around the world, people are specializing, making things for people around the world. No one's in charge of it, so, so it works. Uh, but you take, for example, the iPad, or the iPhone, in that uh, machine, it's got about $190 of parts. It's assembled in China uh, from the score of parts from the scores of countries around the world. Out of that $190, six and a half dollars of those parts are made actually in China. The rest are imported, assembled, and then exported. Uh, Ten dollars of those parts come from the United States. They go to China, assemble, then come back here. So amazing. You, well, a lot of you may eat out tonight at a restaurant. Think of the cooperation there. Uh, farmers grow the food. The companies process the food, package the food, deliver the food. People make furniture, stoves, ovens, refrigerators, utensils, napkins. People supply electricity. All the myriad things that go into making what we take for granted. So when you look at a corporation, when you say the word corporation, you think of big, cold, greedy, but the fact of the matter is, corporations are about working together towards a common goal. If you ever have time, even though it's a little dated, you might look up an essay that was written in the 1950s called I, Pencil. 
high pencil by a fellow named Leonard Reed. And it talks about the simple act of manufacturing a pencil, how it brings together countless individuals around the world, even as something as simple as a pencil. And he talks about how, whether it's the miner of graphite in Sri Lanka, the logger in Oregon, factory workers in Mississippi who help process the graphite, the people supplying the electricity. Amazing, all that goes into some of the seemingly some of these simple things in life. To succeed in business, succeed in the marketplace, you have to work in teams. Whether it's, uh, sometimes it's entrepreneurs, we're all familiar with uh, Apple, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, uh, polar opposites in the sense that Wozniak was a hobbyist, love that stuff. Uh, Jobs was more towards looking at the market. And you know, Wozniak originally, when they invented the Apple I, wanted to give the machine away. Jobs says, are you crazy? Uh, you give it away, obviously we use it, and that will be the end of it. And he saw, he saw the marketing opportunities for it. So oftentimes in companies, it's not just one individual, it's pairs. Famous one is uh, Henry Ford, and a fellow who's now forgotten, a fellow named James Cousins. Uh, they helped create the modern Ford Motor Company. Now, a most unlikely pair he could not uh, imagine. Henry Ford, in terms of administrative abilities, was a klutz. He could, he would, he, he could never manage, if you put him in charge of a little grocery store, he would ruin it. Couldn't even manage his desk. Uh, Cousins couldn't put anything together. He gave him a model, uh, like a, a little boat. He couldn't do it. In that sense, he was a klutz. Yet these two guys, together, created the mightiest industrial at the time, the mightiest industrial company in the world. Revolutionized it. Uh, you see it in Google, print and page. And teams, it's not just in business, obviously. Uh, teams are effective because two individuals or a number of individuals are able to create something that one could not. You look at entertainment, the most famous team was the Beatles, four of them. And when they split apart, their artistry fell apart, never matched what they were able to do together, teamwork. And you see it in the companies today. Large companies are recognizing more and more that if they want to get a real project done, they have to have small teams doing it, eight to 10 people. Jeff Bezos of Amazon talks about the two pizza rule. It takes more than late at night, more than two pizzas to feed the team. The team is too big. And so remember the two pizza rule. And the key to success for the team is what you might call cognitive diversity, not just superficial, but you have to have people from uh, left brain, right brain, young, old, uh, experienced, different backgrounds. For example, if you put a team together from just graduates of Notre Dame, even though you may have come from different backgrounds, the fact that you did your schooling together, probably not going to have as effective team in terms of a specific project in the outside world as if you bring in people from uh, different institutions, different uh, 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 backgrounds. It's that that makes it work. Obviously, you have to have the ability to make the team work. But teams, small teams, 8 to 10, when it gets larger, you get more politics, harder to communicate. Uh, and so uh, 6 to 8 to 10 is the, what makes the team work. But in terms of addition to cooperation, free markets also break down barriers between people. You know, we take it for granted today, whether you're doing a sports team or whether you're starting a business, you want the best people possible. You think, well, that's a no-brainer. Of course you want the, the, the best people to, to make something work. But that's new in human affairs. Until, re until fairly recent times, you would never trust anyone outside of your immediate family or outside of your immediate community or ethnic group. You see it in the Middle East today. Cousins marrying cousins. You don't trust anyone beyond your immediate circle. There's one reason why uh, politically they've had such problems. So the idea of bringing the best people together, whether or no matter where they come from the world, that's a fairly recent phenomenon. You may look at it this way. You may not love your neighbor, but you sure want to sell to your neighbor. So it does, it does break down barriers. You mentioned the global supply chain. But also, this uh, specialization allows you to develop your God-given talents. You can focus on what you have a knack for instead of subsistence. You take uh, Peyton Manning. Now, I know some people think this year he's having a rotten year at Denver, although Denver's 7-0. Oh, 
take that rottenness any time. But, uh, but, uh, but think of it, he doesn't have to worry about his food, he doesn't have to worry about his uniforms, who, who makes his clothes, he doesn't have to worry about the footballs, the helmets, or anything else, the stadium. All that is done so he can focus on one thing, focusing on the game. That kind of focusing only comes when you have that kind of massive cooperation of people doing all kinds of myriad things so you can focus on what you can do best. Nothing about free markets is failure. You learn from failure. You think of the iPhone and the iPod, iPad, great successes of Steve Jobs. But Apple had a lot of failures. Now, if you look at your history books, there was a device in the 1990s called the Newton, a little handheld device. It failed, even though it had a lot of brains behind it. The technology from it, and whether chips or other things, set the stage for future success. You learn from failure. Henry Ford, mentioned before, went bankrupt twice, went broke twice. And he almost went broke a third time. They're trying to make the original Model A, the early 1900s, wasn't a perfect car. Ford was a perfectionist. And Cousins said to him, if you go broke a third time, no one's going to put a penny in any venture you're associated with. we got to go with this vehicle. It's going to have problems. We'll have people go out and fix these vehicles. But we just got to go with it. But you learn from failure. Now Jobs, Steve Jobs, if you took away the name and just took his personality, if you ever read his official biography, uh, which uh, he realized when he was dying from cancer that books and movies would be made about him, and he, so he realized that he would, oh, so what he did was he authorized a biography. Well, uh, Walter Isaacson did the biography and laid it all out, the good and the bad, good, bad, and the ugly because he figured if he didn't do it in a way that was sympathetic, it was going to be done in a way that would be highly unsympathetic. Smart guy. But if you took away the name and just put his personality, no human resources department would touch the guy. I mean, temperamental, took credit for other people, hot temper, manipulative, all the kinds of things you wouldn't want he had in spades. That's why he got fired from his own company before the age of 30. He was such a flop managing other people. And so even though it was a traumatic event for him, and the amazing thing is, even though he had this rotten personality, he learned from his errors. And when he came back to Apple, after uh, some successes and failures in the 12 years when he came back, he had learned, despite his personality, he had learned how to be an effective leader. He learned how to bring creative people <coughs> together and work together. That wasn't something he's born with. He learned it the hard way. So as you go out into the world, don't expect that you're going to get it right or know it in advance. Sometimes you have prodigies, but most of us have to learn the hard way. And uh, so expensive tuition, uh, having you knocked down from time to time, learning, making mistakes, but it's how you really learn in advance. Also about free markets, it enables people from the most unlikely backgrounds to rise up. I mentioned jobs, abandoned by his biological parents, never got over it. Never had one in his biological father. He said, that guy's just a sperm bank. He never would see the guy. He just uh, really, really crushed him. Uh, Larry Ellison, an Oracle orphan. Bill Gates, dropped out from Harvard. Now that's school worth dropping out of, but he, you know, <laughs> or, I know where I am. <laughs> or, or Jan Coombe of WhatsApp, who sold to Facebook for 19 billion. WhatsApp. Uh, he was at one point on food stamps. He was, uh, came from Ukraine. Mother had a hard time. He at one point had a hard time. And yet, and yet, he eventually succeeded. Free markets also, capitalism also, sounds very strange, but promotes trust. That's the only way the system works. When you go to a gas station, you assume the gallon that you get is the same volume yesterday as it is today, as it will be tomorrow. When you go to the restaurant, it's assumed you just don't walk out and stiff the restaurant. Some people do it, but it relies on trust. And where you need uh, instruments of trust, it will create them. Take, for example, the creation of eBay. When that started 20-some-odd years ago, 
the idea that you can have uh, people who are not normal merchants, not regular stores, that do stuff from out of the house selling to each other, you'd say, how would that work? I don't know who you are. You don't know who I am. How, would you, how, how do you have a payment system? You're too small to have a credit card system. So that's how we got PayPal, now an independent company. Instruments of trust are created. It also promotes creativity. Again, look at the automobiles. Moving assembly line, which made that possible, was an extraordinary, extraordinary invention. You look at some of the devices today, extraordinary creations that we now take for granted. And so you, it's not just big things, it can be everyday things. You know, you go to a coffee store, you go to a Starbucks, you know, you have 12 ounces, 16 ounces, 20 ounces, yet the lids are the same size, even though the cups have different volumes of liquid, 12, 16, 20 ounces, the lid sizes are the same. Somebody figured out. You don't have to have so much inventory. You make the lids uh, ubiquitous, make them common. Uh, little things, little things. Sometimes big things. I mentioned high tech, we think that's, oh yeah, that's cool stuff. But one of the biggest things in agriculture was the invention of the tractor from 100 years ago. Once upon a time, you look at these old movies, old, old footages of what it took to harvest a field. These huge combines, scores of mules and horses pulling these things. You had to have millions of far animals. So when you had the tractor, you didn't need uh, fields to grow forage for animals, which you can now grow for human food. You take uh, shipping. Once upon a time, it was thought when you ship things on a ship, you wanted to get as many things possible in the hull of the ship. You didn't want to waste space. When somebody came along, only McLean, came up with that, we think is common, the container. The container is, in terms of a ship, not so efficient. You can have a container with only half the stuff that, that instead, of a, instead of a full container. But what it did was make it a common thing that you could standardize and a vastly increased trade around the world. There's a book, if you ever Ford had a book called The Box, not a very sexy title. It's, you know, not like some of the things we see on HBO or Netflix, but it's but containers. Um, but it, it, it shows how something seemingly simple as a box can revolutionize trade. It also enables people to see what others don't. Sometimes people invent things and don't realize what they've done. For example, I mentioned Steve Jobs. Back in the late 1970s, he visited the laboratories, research laboratories at Xerox in Menlo Park, California. And he saw something, he said, this is unbelievable. What eventually became called the mouse. So you didn't have to always type in on a, a device. And Xerox didn't realize what it had. He saw its <coughs> possibilities. Another example, if there are any nutritionists here, or vegans, I apologize in advance, but it's a Ray Kroc of McDonald's. The man who created McDonald's. Back in the 1950s, he was a guy in his 50s, never had achieved great success, was selling, selling milkshake machines out in California, and stumbled across a couple of, a few hamburger stands called the McDonald Brothers. And he, his initial reaction was, gosh, you're selling a lot of burgers, if I can get them to expand, I can sell them more milkshake machines. Well, soon became bigger than milkshake machines. The McDonald brothers did not have the ambition. He bought them out. But he saw something. If any of you worked in a restaurant, fast food or whatever, you know it's the toughest business around. You're constantly cleaning. Your inventory is always going bad. Tough business, high mortality rate. The idea that you could have chains of restaurants was seen as impossible. You might be able to do it regionally, like Howard Johnson's used to do in New England, handful of others around the country, but the idea of a national chain impossible, what the McDonald brothers had invented was, you know, they still have their things down now around called diners. Diners are wonderful because the menus are fantastic. It's literature. All the stuff they have there, 500 different things they, they, they offer. I don't know how they do it. But what McDonald brothers did was actually go in the opposite direction, just have a handful of items standardized. And Kroc realized that kind of simple standardization you could do this nationwide and then internationally. Saw what the McDonald brothers did not. So 
the real morality of free markets of capitalism is this. Wealth is not physical things. Real source of capital is the human mind, which you're developing now. That's the real capital. Take, for example, a thing they call a natural resource, oil. Oil in and of itself is not a natural resource. In and of itself, it's just gooey stuff. You can't eat it, you can't drink it, you can't feed it to camels. I mean, it just is gooey. If you want to see the depressor of property values because if any animal got near it, it gets sick. There's human ingenuity that turned this glop into something that a modern economy can't live without. We're taking information age. Chips, silicon, sand. Whoever knew when you went to the beach as a kid that this would enable you, using sand, would enable you to bring the whole world to your fingertips, have literally handheld computers. And you see, too, what, what, in fact, the whole thing they call economics. Now, unfortunately, some professors still say economics is about the allocation of studying the allocation of scarce resources. That is utterly boring. The allocation of the heartbeat almost goes dead. The allocation of scarce resources. Boy, nothing sexy in that. <laughs> Turns it off even nerds. But, 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 but what economics really is, what economics really is, is about creating resources. Creating resources. I mentioned the example of oil, silicon. And how, how, how do you create resources? You do it through human ingenuity. And this gets to the essence of where we are today. Ask yourself a very simple question. What is the difference between us and the world today and people living in the Stone Age? Human beings, same appetites, same planet, same resources. The difference between us and them is we have more knowledge. We know more. That is what separates us from them more knowledge. And how do you get knowledge? By experimentation. Whether in the marketplace, failure, you learn, mention the Newton, constantly trying to discover more knowledge. That's how we move ahead. And as long as knowledge is not destroyed, we can progress. Take World War II. Absolute physical devastation. Japan actually we dropped two bombs on them. Europe, physical devastation. Millions of people, young people, dead. How do you recover from that? The fact was, knowledge was not destroyed. And so, thanks to the US security umbrella, Western Europe and Japan, within a few years after this devastating conflict, were producing more, and their economies are producing more than they were before the conflict began. Knowledge is the key. You see it all the time, you see it all the time. For example, California has had a devastating water shortage. That is a result of incompetence. Yes, they haven't had much rain. But then you look at a country like Israel, where rainfall is about half of what it was a few decades ago. But they don't have what California has. Why? Because of knowledge. You know, Israel was founded in 1948. So today, the country has 10 times as many people as it did. 67 years ago, three times as much arable land, 16 times the agricultural output it had at the beginning, 50 times the industrial output, and yet its net use of water in the country as a whole, the net use of water is 10% less today than it was 65 years ago. Technology, little things like a shower head, that has just as much push as a normal one, but uses one third of the water. Recycling, they have desalination plants. Turns seeming wastewater, and use for agriculture and other, that you can use again. So even though the rainfall is short, the country's in a desert, not a problem with water. California, because of blockages, political blockages, they finally got a desalination plant about half the size that the Israelis put in, cost three times as much. It took them 10 years for in Israel, they do it in a couple of years, get the thing done. So human ingenuity, 
As long as knowledge is there, as long as you have that ability to create knowledge, you move ahead. And the key thing that's part of it, this gets to politics, it's not enough just to create the knowledge, you have to have the power to develop it and bring it to fruition. China, for example. Read the history of China, numerous inventions. In the 1500s, their shipbuilding was way ahead of Europe. They were starting ready to go around the world. And the mandarins ruling China decided they didn't like that. So they crushed it, broke up the boats, told the sailors to get lost. They didn't kill them. And so you have to have knowledge and power, as George Gilbert puts it, knowledge and power. And so in free markets, it creates resources, but it also always, if you allow it, turns shortages into abundance turns luxuries into common commodities. For example, I mentioned the automobile. 110 years ago, a typical car, in real terms, cost over $120,000 in today's dollars. It was a toy for the rich in the early 1900s. And along comes Henry Ford, his gifted engineers who create the moving assembly line, which turns a toy for the rich into every something that every working person could afford. You take what we used to call cell phones, handhelds, mobile devices. First one from Motorola over 30 years ago, big as a shoebox, weighed like a brick, 45 minute battery life. First one cost $3,995. Today, they give them away if you sign up with certain plans. They do everything except maybe grow hair. Maybe they'll do that in the next, next model. Apple, you know, Seven, but but it is but it is but it's it's it's, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary turning turning scarcity into abundance if you let it, and it can also you know, wherever you let it work, it will do that, and that create luxuries and create uh, new new uh, ways of doing things. And then we amazing thing is human nature being what it is, we take it for granted. We take it for granted. You know, you have a mobile device today. You place a call to Outer Mongolia. Takes more than 10 seconds. You say, what a piece of crap. It takes more than 10 <laughs> seconds to get this thing done. But you see with flat screen TVs, today a few hundred bucks, big things, great pictures. 10, 12 years ago, they cost $10,000, $12,000. Don't work as well as what you have today. Now let me talk about now, closing, about profits. Profits are often portrayed as charging more than you should. Why should you charge more than your expenses? The usual answer is, well, you gotta have some incentive, reward for the entrepreneur, so you gotta have profit. You need money for it, you know, and that, you, need to, you need to do that. But then you say, well, why should somebody get billions instead of millions? I mean, how, how, how much can you eat? What do you need it for? You're charging too much. But the thing is, the thing is, it goes beyond. It goes beyond just incentive. It has actually, this, is, this sounds counterintuitive, it has a moral foundation. It gets to this. Some of you are familiar with Joseph Schumpeter, Austrian economist, the words creative destruction. When you have dynamic economy, always creating, not stagnating, which before the Industrial Revolution was the norm. You have a dynamic economy, not only are you creating, but you're also destroying. I come out of the print industry. Everything I learned growing up in the magazine business got destroyed by the internet. The whole model went kaput. So we had to reinvent ourselves. Sounds, oh yeah, reinvent. It's a bloody tough process. Because while you're doing it, you don't have a playbook. Are we doing this right? There is no roadmap for it. That's why we live in an age, as they say, where you can eat well or sleep well, but not both. I do the eating well, the sleep part's another matter. But things are always changing. When things change, it destroys capital. Take the print industry. A little over 20 years ago, the New York Times spent over a billion, two hundred million dollars buying the the, the Boston Globe and a couple of uh, newspapers in the region. A couple of years ago, they sold it for 
real terms, less than $100 million. Billion dollars, destroyed. Constant change, destroying the old. What that means is you need profit to replace what you've destroyed. You need profit to finance the huge advances that come with that kind of creativity. So it's in that sense a cost of doing business. The most entrepreneurs don't do it for the money, but they have to have the capital to develop what they have in their minds, turning what's in the minds into something real. And the thing about human nature too, you know, we're fallen in many ways, is a peculiarity of organizations, is that organizations left to their own devices always lose sight of why they created in the first place. And they become absorbed with their own special interests. And that was hammered home by a fellow named C. Northcote Parkinson. He was a British historian. And back in the 19th, wonderful British name, C. Northcote Parkinson. Great name for a cocktail party. <laughs> but but what, he, what, he, what he noticed, what he noticed was, and this is true of organizations, left to their own devices, they become wasteful, they become stagnant. He noticed something, he's writing a history of the British Navy. He noticed that after World War I, Britain had the largest navy in the world by far. And after the war, because they didn't think they'd have to fight wars again, the navy was sharply downsized. Ships were mothballed, sailors discharged, dock workers laid off. Sharp downsizing of the navy. But he noticed that the agency running the navy, the government agency running the navy, got bigger as the navy got smaller. And he came up with the, came up with the, the observation. The size of organizations often has very little to do with the work needed to be done. And because the, because the admiralty, as they called in Britain, got bigger, they soon well, must have more work to do. No, it was make work. And people didn't even realize it. Now, the thing about free markets is, if you get that kind of waste, you go out of business, unless the government steps in to bail you out make those kind of mistakes. So it doesn't allow that kind of waste and stagnation. Now people say, well, if these markets are so good, why do we have things scandals? Why do we have huge gap price gouging? Why do we have people like Bernie Madoff? What about all of that? Well, news alert, news flash, human nature does not change. If you look at the Bible, you realize we've been up to bad things going back thousands of years. This kind of misbehavior did not come with Adam Smith. He had been with us since our creation. That's why James Madison, the father of our Constitution, James Madison once observed, he said, if men were angels, we'd not need government. We'd not need laws. Well, manifestly, we're not angels. Maybe grandchildren are, at least to a certain age. But uh, someday you'll see the truth of that. But, but, it is, it is, you know, we do need rules. We do need rules. Law, properly done as a teacher. But there's a whole world of difference between laws that say don't drive when you're drunk, don't go 100 miles an hour in the school zone, and rules and laws that tell you what to drive, when to drive, and where to drive. Striking a proper balance, sensible rules of the road that don't get in the way of creativity, don't get in the way of innovation, but also always remind us what is right and what is wrong because part of us will always go to the edge. This leads us to health care. Ask yourself, yeah, why do we have a health care crisis? Because after all, well, people say, well, we want too much of it. People like me are getting older and uh, we, we want more health care. We need more health care services. The body begins to break down. So. Uh, they, they say that's why we have a crisis. But ask yourself a very simple question. Why is demand for health care considered a crisis when demand for everything else in this economy is seen as an opportunity? If people want more cars, manufacturers in Detroit and elsewhere will be glad to help you out. People want more apps. Numerous writers glad to come to your assistance. So why is our people wanting something seen as an opportunity but in healthcare, it's seen as a disaster. You, know, you can listen to these experts. Oh, we have to cut down on healthcare consumption. You know, and it, it's spinning out of control. And the answer is we don't have real free markets in healthcare. 
We have pieces of it, which is why we still produce more <coughs> new medical devices, more new drugs than the rest of the world. But it's not a real free market. It's third-party payer. There's disconnect between provider and consumer. Because we've grown up with it, we don't realize how weird it is. If you go to a clinic or hospital, and you ask in advance what the treatment's going to cost, you're going to get a very strange look. Because it means one of two things. Either you're uninsured, or you're a lunatic. Why would you want to know the price? Let the insurers worry about it. Can you imagine going out to dinner tonight? Going to a restaurant saying, I don't care what it costs, let Blue Shield or Aetna or Medicare worry about it. So the system goes haywire. It's not real free markets. And this, this, is, this is why we have the crisis. Fortunately, in a very lurching way, we're beginning to get it. But right now, we still don't have it. But we're beginning to get it. You see little signs of it, little signs of it. One little sign is flu shots. We're in the season again. Once upon a time, if you wanted a flu shot, you made an appointment at a clinic or hospital or your doctor. Go in, get the flu shot, a big deal. Today, you can get it anywhere. Go to the airport, go to the drugstore, go to the gas station, say, fill her up, do, do you know, walk the windshield, give me a shot, and we'll be on the way. <laughs> Get it anywhere. You see, you see it more and more in walk in clinics, where they have a doc on hand or, or, or nurse practitioner. Research shows that 80% of our maladies can be treated by technicians or nurse practitioners. The rest of the other 20%, we need a full fledged physician. So you walk in anytime, 24-7. A lot of states, they have barriers to that. So you've got to get more free markets. And that way you can get more effective safety nets. Bottom line of it, bottom line of that is, what's more basic than health? Food. Food is more, no, no food, we, we don't have anything. But government doesn't run agriculture, it's involved, but it doesn't run it. If government ran agriculture in this country, we'd have no more obesity. We'd all be starving. <laughs> they, 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 they tried it in Russia and China. It did not work very well. And so, farmers you know, grow the food, truckers deliver the food, companies press them. We have everything from uh, restaurants to uh, supermarkets, grocery stores, vans, hotels, campuses sell the food. We keep our problem getting it. Everything from food stamps to food banks to deal with it. Why can't we do the same thing in healthcare? Have real entrepreneurship real entrepreneurship, and have effective safety nets instead of the hodgepodge system we have today. There are various ways to do it. And there are big things coming, and you want that kind of free market to develop them. Just close in one, one, one example. It's now becoming more and more. You hear more and more about genome sequencing. A few years ago, that cost $10 million. Now it's a couple thousand. In a few years, it's going to be $100. What that means is we're going to be developing we allow it. Personalized cures. They have a certain disease. They can personalize it looking at your own particular body. Might not work for anybody else, but it'll work for you. That kind of personalized care just is unbelievable that these things can happen. You see it in cancer in terms of the breakthroughs there. So big things are about to happen, but you have to have that kind of environment where it can happen. So in closing, in closing, why, why do we have this growth, this getting away from economic stagnation? <clears throat> why did it happen in Europe and then North America more than anywhere else? What, what made it possible? And here, this is very unpolitically correct. Since I'm not running for anything, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and, that is, and that is the critical role in terms of creating knowledge, critical role of religion and faith. Judeo-Christian heritage encouraged, even though the book will tell you the opposite, opened up curiosity, the pursuit of curiosity, experimentation in a way no other faith did. The Bible, for example, Holy Bible, was not dictated. It was observations of others, what they saw and beheld. That meant it wasn't all that, that, that was all the knowledge there was. And so we look at scientific advances. Contrary to the myths, up until the 1600s, they were mostly done by priests. 
mostly done by priests. There's a scene, you're trying to find how God made this world, how, how, how it's working. The scene is a good thing. So why Europe, the sci these scientific advances, not the rest of the world? Rodney Stark, who's out at Baylor, uh, wrote a book called How the West Won, not How the West Was Won, but How the West Won. And uh, he says in it, Christian faith in reason and in progress was the foundation on which Western success was achieved. Science arose only in Europe, because only there did people think that science could and should be done. A faith derivative from medieval technology. Moreover, the medieval Christian faith in reason and progress was constantly reinforced by actual progress, by technical and organizational innovations. So they're not polar opposites. Commerce and philanthropy, not polar opposites. Faith and progress, not polar opposites. Quite the same, all together. Thank you very much. industry, um, especially here in the States with Elon Musk and Tesla and um, sort of self-driving cars and that Apple car being announced. But I was curious as to what you see as the future of transportation, um, like passenger mostly, um, here in the States and maybe even beyond. I was, I was just curious. Um, well, what's been remarkable about uh, the transportation industry is that despite the advances of technology, an automobile today <clears throat> is vastly different from what it was 20 or 30 years ago. The number of computer chips in it. A typical auto has, I think, about five times the technical prowess of the rocket ships that went to uh, the moon. Amazing, amazing progress. But you look at a typical aircraft, even though they're uh, much better today than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago, the progress has been evolutionary, incremental. And uh, uh, some now believe, especially with uh, the promise of 3D printing. You know, you take the A380, I think about 150 parts now come from uh, 3D printing, that uh, you're going to get great leaps in terms of uh, advance, in terms of making aircraft and the like. As for uh, automobiles, uh, so far, even though some advances have been made, they haven't, they've made some progress, but the real bottleneck still, and we'll see if Musk breaks it, he thinks he can, is limitations of the battery. Uh, they just don't store very much, and they take forever to fill. Now you take your uh, iPad, I know at night, uh, got a number of hours you have to devote to filling the darn thing up. And uh, so they, 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 they've got to make the real breakthroughs there. And in terms of driverless cars, uh, they may work in some areas, but I think what the technology is going to do, regardless if you don't get a driverless car, what you are going to see is that you're going to have technology that will prevent accidents, that more and more will tell you uh, something is going wrong and to do something on it. I mean, it's just a standard thing now when you back up, you have your little TV set there. Uh, they always, lawyers make sure they say, you know, you must not just rely on this. But it's nice to know that you're not backing up into something. Uh, years from now, years ago, we've had these devices where if you turn or you come close to something, you go, there's some noise to let you know you're near something. You're near something. So uh, I, uh, whether we ever get a driverless car that's ubiquitous, uh, I'm not so sure. I like to, I 
shouldn't say this, many police are in highway patrol. But anyway, it's fun to let loose once in a while. <laughs> and uh, and uh, now uh, the nice thing about the technology is uh, if you have to rush to something, it can uh, guide you in a way where you're not likely to uh, ignore road conditions and the like. Remember, half of our accidents are not vehicles going into each other. It's vehicles going into apartments, trees, telephone poles, and the like. And so uh, the technology that can help prevent that uh, just is that braking systems now have made huge advances. So that's where I think the real promise is. And, uh, and you also see, thanks to technology, uh, things like Uber, where uh, certainly in a city, it's nice even though you pay for it, uh, it's nice to be able to call up when it's pouring rain and uh, a car will come and get you. Uh, even though you can never, in New York, you can never find a cab, but you can get an Uber when, when the weather is, uh, as they call it, inclement. So uh, yes, in terms of transportation, I think in terms of materials for aircraft, uh, the next uh, generation, some big stuff could come. And in terms of automobiles, which is still the biggest killer in this country, amazingly vehicular accidents, and he's still 30,000 plus people a year die. And uh, uh, that's where I think the technology can sharply reduce uh, the loss of life and injury from the vehicular accidents. So that's where I think the big thing, not driverless cars, but just safe driving in spite of ourselves. That's, that'd be nice. Thank you. My name's Steven, I'm a chemical engineer senior, and my question is, do you ever see, foresee a uh, point at which a private sector organization like Consumer Reports will be able to replace government regulatory bodies like the Food and Drug Administration? If so, why? If not, why not? Um, well, the, the, the role, the role we're talking about the FDA, uh, that needs, their, their mentality is still 1906 or 1962 after the, the Little scandal. They, uh, their testing is that a lot of it is still uh, geared to the old thing. You have a placebo, you do uh, elaborate tests. And so what's afflicting, talking about what's afflicting development of drugs is what they call EROM's law. You're familiar with Moore's law, that uh, the chip will become more powerful, twice as powerful every 18, 24 months. EROM's law is the opposite. If you get a drug approved, becomes more expensive and more consuming of time. A new drug cost a company $2 billion to bring to market. Uh, 10 years from conception to when they can put it out. And where the FDA is really falling down is in the area of generics. Why does it take several years or so backlog to approve generics? I mean, a generic is a copy. It's a fancy word for a copy of an existing drug. And you have to do a little tweaking, so it's not a, but you know, why, 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 why would that take years? That's why you had that scandal recently, when this guy buys a drug company and then raises the price 700% or whatever it was. And the reason he's having to knock the price down again is there's a loophole in the rules where uh, for certain areas of medicine, you can take existing approved substances, ingredients, and mix them together to create something new not have to go through 10 years of a clinical trial. So another company, and then it only is a narrow area, but here it worked, was able to uh, put some, putting something together very quickly where you have competition. So you're not gonna have that monopoly. So uh, in, in terms of uh, regulation, um, again, our organizations never innovate unless uh, they, they feel the need to do it. And so, uh, we do want to know when we buy food we're not getting poisoned. So you, you, need, you need rules and regulations. But uh, uh, you need also to uh, constantly, every 10 years, make sure they're not falling behind the times. Because otherwise you continue to do what you're doing. For example, in terms of health care, since it's a huge issue, the most personal thing possible, uh, ask yourselves, why did hospitals Clinics, docs, sold slow to recent years to take up things like email and uh, faxes in terms of the practice phoning, in terms of the practice of medicine. Because Medicare and Medicaid wouldn't reimburse you for it. 
why are the number of gerontologists beyond the baby boom? You think gerontologists, people are focusing on peculiarities of the elderly in terms of our health care needs, would be a mushrooming uh, specialty. Well, consultation is not easily reimbursed. A medical test, yes. So uh, we have fewer gerontologists at least three years ago than we did 10 years before, even though the uh, customer base for gerontology, would, now there are other ways of getting around that. But uh, yeah, you do need the uh, uh, rules of the road. But in terms of, uh, terms of research, there's an interesting book now, now just came out by a fellow named Matt Ridley He's in the House of Lords in Britain. He's researched uh, going back, some of the stuff you can ignore the conclusions of, like he sort of implies progress is inevitable, it isn't. But one of his findings was that in terms of innovation, in terms of creating inventions, and big new things in healthcare and elsewhere, that government funding is no better or even has even less good results than just relying on the private sector. And he went back and looked at the 1800s, early 1900s, when he had huge advances, x-rays and the like, and found that uh, Britain and the US, which then did not have government funding, versus French and Germany, which did, the US and Britain did as well or better than where the government was pushing this. So the key thing is to have that environment where people can go for that curiosity and the job will get done. In the rules of the road, the key thing is to keep it simple, sensible, understandable, and re, 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 redo them in light of new technology. So you don't have these scandals of the FDA sitting on a drug, people dying, especially with cancer, and uh, there's a potent drug out there that may help them. It's been used in Europe. The FDA says, well, I haven't gone through the processes here. Well, if you're in, uh, in a moral stage and you voluntarily say, I'll take the risk, because you know, the, the alternative is the starkest one possible, why shouldn't you be allowed to do it? Why shouldn't you be allowed to do it? That's where you need to update technology. This is going to be our last question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. My name is Juan Jose Debu. I'm a senior political science and finance major. And I was noticing that nowadays there's a lot of emphasis for corporations to be green and to be socially responsible. And it doesn't seem the case that was many years ago. And to me, it looks like that's because, not because of regulation, but rather because that's what the customers are asking for. Do you think nowadays, based on how much flack the corporations are getting because of tax inversions and because of trying to pay less taxes, that we're going to see something similar of customers demanding corporations to pay more taxes? And, and if so, where do you see that going? Um, well, uh, the nice thing about free markets is uh, there's not one size that fits all. And uh, you have uh, uh, some predilections. Uh, you want to go to uh, those uh, vendors who uh, meet your particular wants, not, not just physical, but the, in terms of what the company may do. There was a study done a few years ago, and I'm, I don't know whether it worked today. What they did was they took 20 customers of Dunkin' Donuts, and 20 customers from Starbucks, and asked them, they gave them the money to do it, said for two weeks, the Dunkin' Donuts people would go to Starbucks, and the Starbucks people would go to Dunkin' Donuts, and uh, then tell us what your experiences were. The amazing thing is, none of them wanted to go to the other uh, vendor again. The Dunkin' Donuts people wanted to stick to Dunkin' Donuts. Their two weeks of free Starbucks goodies did not persuade them. Starbucks people really didn't like Dunkin' Donuts. They liked the Starbucks. So uh, yes, there, there are particular uh, uh, things that people and if you're, you know, Starbucks is much more attentive to uh, green than uh, Dunkin' Donuts is. And uh, that's all of the good. But you want also, though, you want to be sure you're getting effective green, not just a label. Make sure that uh, if you like uh, stuff that's organic, that it is uh, truly better than the alleged processed food. And uh, so you're getting your money's worth. 
But in terms of uh, in terms of what you mentioned with inversions, where companies you're seeing one made play out now, a uh, major company, Pfizer's buying an Irish company for billions, they'll move their mailbox address to Ireland and save a bundle of money and be able to spend more money in research. That's not going to be customer change. That's going to come when the U.S. wakes up to the fact it's got one of the worst tax codes in the world. I didn't get that today. But we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world, developed world. So uh, if we lowered our rates, and once upon a time we were ahead of the curve in making uh, our shores friendly to capital, which is people and uh, resources, um, when we do that, and we'll do it after this next election, then you, you won't see conversions anymore. There'll be no need for it. Ireland, which uh, we learned long ago, uh, didn't have a whole lot of natural resources, small, but it did have access to the European market because it became a member of what they used to call the common market, now the European Union. And starting in the uh, early 80s, it went wild on uh, throwing out tax incentives to companies to uh, relocate to Ireland, saying, where are your bridgehead to uh, the European market? And their corporate tax rate is 12.5%. Ours is almost 40. And that's why people want to buy Irish companies. And even when Ireland went through the ringer after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, the one thing they never did, even though the European Union put in, the Germans put intense pressure on them, they said, we're not changing our corporate rate. That's our ace in the hole. We're not changing it. We want to cut off the money fund. We're not changing it. And so uh, Ireland came back <coughs> far faster than Greece and some other countries from the travails of 2008-2009. And uh, so uh, one of the good things out of this campaign, which would be a hoot if the country's future was at stake, you know, a presidential <laughs> place, almost as interesting as naked in the jungle, there were you know, some of these fake wrestling matches to see what they're going to do in the next debate. He's going to punch each other. You know, it's great stuff for entertainment. But uh, actually, one serious good thing that's coming out of it is that virtually every, so far, every Republican candidate has felt the need to come up with major tax simplification ideas. And among Democrats, even though the White House doesn't like it, the Democrats is now a consensus of at least doing it on the business side. Uh, they, they're, they're, ready to, they're ready to simplify and lower, lower the, the rate. And so uh, and I think after this campaign, you'll get the mandate to do it on the personal side. So in 2017, I think you're going to see major positive tax changes. Particulars, who knows? I've got my ideas of a flat tax. Others have theirs. The result is going to be a much more pro-growth environment, which will mean this economy will start to grow again. And when you have growth, a lot of life is better. Liabilities of entitlements don't look so bad when the asset side is growing. And uh, so uh, I think uh, you're going to see that. And the inversion thing, you know, in a couple of years, people will say, inversion, you're talking about science as something with the air, the atmosphere, <coughs> snow or something. Um, that's what's going to happen. But yeah, co companies try to appeal to a certain clientele. And in terms of, though, on things like tax things, change the code, uh, recognize human nature, change the code, and we'll all be better off. Well, uh, before I abuse your hospitality anymore, let me say uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, good luck at Pitts. Since I'm not in Pittsburgh, I can say go green. Yes. <laughs>